a few colleagues before I came along, and one of the things I was told is, for God's sake, don't teach people how to suck eggs. Um, I don't think there's any danger of that. You probably will feel a bit like a grandmother, but not that I'm teaching you to suck eggs. Hopefully, you'll be in a sort of, oh, look at that, isn't it sweet? They're beginning to take baby steps kind of way. So please be kind. Um, we are just emerging into this world. We're recognizing new tools, and we are seeing how we can best use them in a safe way, and in a way that will be trusted and appreciated by our audiences, and by people like yourselves, who also use this airspace and rely upon it for your business. What I'm going to do is just quickly tell you who we are. I'm from BBC Research and Development. We're an integrated part of the public service part of BBC. <coughs> we'll just give you an idea of our capabilities. I'm going to very quickly touch on some projects over the last three years where the BBC has begun to explore these sorts of tech. Um, and I'm going to go into a little bit more depth on the one that was happening over the last six months. i uh, just give you an outline of the things we tried to do of the challenges we came up against, the achievements that we did manage to do, some of which we think are pretty significant, the things that we didn't manage to do, but what we've learned from that, and then give you a quick overview of our, our aspirations and the directions we'd like to take our work in this technological field. Um, to, hopefully it'll give you an idea that we're doing this safely, we're doing this in a professional manner, and that we can be partners alongside you as this develops as a fully fledged part of both the aviation and we hope the broadcast industry as well. Um, we are 150 staff, uh, mostly engineers and scientists, but some support staff, like <coughs> the support umbrella. We have three labs in the north at Media City, uh, in the south uh, in the White City area. Media City is our new studio complex in Salford. And we have a central lab as well that's in the middle of London. And we do research into a whole range of broadcast technology, some of which you probably expect. So we look at new cameras, we look at special effects. We also look a great deal at uh, distribution. So we have a, a strong hand in the way that spectrum is managed and allocated in the UK, around the broadcast area specifically, but as I'm sure you're aware, as digital switchover happens and some of that spectrum becomes available, there's a, a broader debate on how spectrum is used, and it's a valuable commodity. Um, we look at how media is managed. Media is, the digital media is opening up huge new opportunities, and part of that is the use of UAS, um, also archiving and audience experience. And we are, if you like, a, an early warning, possibly in a different sense to most of you understand early warning to be, I'll admit that, we don't have big, anyway. Um, we do early warning and problem solving for the BBC as a whole. Broadcast is a technology that's moving along very quickly. We're hitting multiple phase changes, if you like, paradigm shifts in the way that audiences consume content, and the way that media is put together, and the technologies that are available to make media content. And all of those things need dedicated staff to maintain the expertise so that your license fee is spent in the wisest and, and best valued way. So, naturally, oh, before I go, I'm going to do a quick note on the maker chair. These terms are used quite heavily. I'm actually trying to push people in our organisation away from drone. Drone has got, I'm afraid, just too much baggage. Um, as a broadcaster, we have to present a particular way of using this technology and a way of our audience is understanding it. And for all the great work that's going on with drones, in various theatres around the world, it's simply something that we really ought to disassociate ourselves from. It's far too complex, and that isn't to denigrate the fine work that is done in that area. I also, also I should try and stay away from UAV. UAV tells people to look at vehicles. We are not actually particularly interested in vehicles. We're interested in systems. We think the regulatory framework is interested in systems. And if everyone fetishizes the latest, greatest little plane that flies around, we miss the key point which is the people, which is the training, which is the down in communications, all of which are extremely complicated, and if we get that wrong, and we get too hung up on, wow, that thing's got two engines, one engine, those are important points, clearly, but we've got to bear in the entire system. And that's kind of an education process internally for us, and hopefully for colleagues across broadcast who may take this on as well. Um, so, as I say, there are roughly three years of UAS I'm going to talk about. There's a chap following on who's got all the nice pictures, so I'm not going to show you any fails, I'm not going to spoil his, steal his thunder, so I'm just going to quickly touch on some things that are going on. Uh, interior filming using quadcopters, this is our new broadcasting house facility in central London, it's very sexy, very nice. Um, some guys from uh, Global Video, which, which is a part of the World Service, flew a quadcopter inside that building and got some shots that actually you couldn't have got any other way. And while we Obviously, in this context, think about UAV, UAS in, a, in, a, in an airspace management context. I think it's worth bearing in mind that if this takes off and is a properly supported industry, some of these will be deployed in domains where 
Airspace management isn't actually an issue because you can do things with the UAS indoors in a building you can't do any other way. Um, it was a very nice film. I wish I had it, but the guy was about all this. Sorry. Um, okay, uh, Natural History Rotorcraft. <laughs> this is what you're going to see later on, so I'm not going to spoil it. You probably recognise that airframe. Essentially, the Natural History Unit, they're based down in uh, Bristol. Uh, they have done a number of experiments on different sorts of systems. They've done the sort of standard collective pitch miniaturised helicopter with a petrol engine. Uh, and they've also moved on now towards this uh, eight-bladed octocopter. The interesting thing to point out here is the camera that's in use. Um, this is uh, it's a Sony NEX FS100, and that is getting really about the smallest camera you can get reasonable broadcast footage for this kind of material out of. But you probably see it, you know, it's quite a hefty thing for this thing to lift, and you're only going to get a few minutes flight out of it. Um, this was a, a pretty successful project, but again, the Natural History Unit has got a different set of contexts. They tend not to work around big crowds, because you know, lions don't work well around big crowds either. <laughs> um, it's, it's a crossover of the safety case. Um, also, they tend to operate in areas of the world where um, the, the, the regulatory framework is a bit different. They're just not around things that they're going to bump in. You, know, you might damage an acacia bush, but the, the insurance can cover that. That's fine. Um, and then and, and the Natural History Unit are working quite actively on this, uh, both themselves and with partners as well. And they do, in fact, have trained up partner, uh, pilots on their staff. Um, this is the one I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. This was something that uh, BBC Research and Development did in concert with News and Sport as the broadcast partners. And this was a fixed wing project. Uh, this was called, eventually, iFlyer. Um, and it came out largely out of a relationship with Southampton University. We've got a, a great relationship with that research institution across very many areas. And there was a bit of a sort of, well, what, what else have you got? And, oh, we've got these UASs. That's great. Let's see what we can do with that. So, if you like, it was at the outset a solution looking for a problem, but an opportunity arose as well, because you may have noticed this summer, there was a major sporting event. I don't know if you might call that. Um, one of the things that was happening with that was a torch relay going around the country. Now, that was a very, very challenging broadcast uh, event to cover. Um, hopefully, one day you'll get to see... Uh, a presentation about how that works. I'm not going to go into it now, but if you imagine one way of every possible way of joining a camera to a television distribution network, all of those we use, and we tried to add a few more into the mix. Um, that was a real challenge. Um, if you like, this is a role which is possibly the closest and the most ambitious, the closest to a helicopter type uh, role deployment, um, but slightly different. So I'll, I'll just go into a little bit more detail. Um, Essentially, what we're trying to do there with this project is explore the disruptive technologies in two main areas. What we were trying to do is, oh, this is Ralph Rivera, the head of our division, standing underneath an earlier version of a UAS, and very enthusiastic. It did help that we had huge enthusiasm from everybody looking at going, drones! But no. Um, <laughs> <coughs> it's fine, we wind them back in from that. Um, yeah, so what we'd want to do now is explore a couple of different technologies with this platform. One of them is to create connectivity between recording in the field. Uh, another one is to actually add more content, the, the aerial photography type approach. Um, and we also want a sort of persistence and a low cost associated with this. Um, we're not, you probably uh, may be familiar with the funding framework of the BBC. Essentially, we get a pot of money with a licence fee settlement, and then that carries us through until we get the next one. Um, we don't get more money for doing more things. Uh, we, we can't put another show on the telly and sell more adverts around that, which is just as it should be. You don't want adverts on television, and the license fee is a great framework. But it does mean that we, when we introduce new technology, it's about adding value and bringing in new capabilities at lower cost. So I'll come to that again later on just to give you an idea of where it sits in the spectrum. So in order to get this done with this particular device. So as it came to us, Deco2, as it was then, was a research platform for Southampton. And what we needed to do was to get it working with our payloads. We had to get that certified as a safe system. We're over 20 kilograms. It puts us into another class of airframe for certification purposes, which is a challenge. We need to get the BBC certified as an operator. Essentially, we have to go from being a broadcast organisation to having the same sorts of safety management and responsibility structures as one might expect from a, a, a moderate-sized commercial aircraft operator. And that's, that's a step change in organisation, and it's a change in culture. It isn't as big a change as you might think. We are a very safety-conscious organisation. We have a very, very strong uh, safety management culture <coughs> and professionals throughout. So that one was a challenge that we met quite well. 
we had to plan safe flights at locations, and that exposed us to some various challenges. Um, what tools there are for planning flights vary enormously from the very accessible, something like Skydeeming perhaps, which you, a lot of you would be familiar with. It's a wonderful piece of software, very low barrier to entry. Um, God, could we do with some 1 to 10,000 maps? Oh, that would be brilliant, but you can't get it. Um, and we want to operate safe flights at locations, which, with caveats, we did. We want to deliver good quality services to our broadcast clients. That is a bigger challenge. Uh, what we have managed to do then, as I say, is we put together a um, structure which allows us to confidently say that we can take on either with internal capabilities or bringing in as a wet hire uh, with a pilot and flight crew. We have got a structure of responsibility which goes right through to the corporate director level with the safety format in place to plan and execute safe flights. We've demonstrated that in limited circumstances, but the processes are robust and they're well documented. Um, we also managed to have an aircraft named on Blue Peter, which is an achievement in itself. If you'd seen the rules we have to go through to get competitions verified, you'd be very impressed. Um, we got 50% of the payloads we wanted to get airborne airborne. Um, the, the, the camera platform worked pretty well. Uh, certainly the control and direction and stabilization worked excellently. Downlink is a challenge. Um, currently, you're only going to get standard definition downlink out of an aircraft. Uh, but we managed to do that reliably. We do have technologies in the pipeline coming from our own laboratories that will make high definition downlink possible, and that's within licensed managed spectrum. So that's 40 pounds a day to get a license to put an HD link in, and it's a very straightforward web interface to do that. And we managed to run a short sequence of test flights at specified controlled locations. That's really as far as our, our, our airframe certification will let us go, uh, but within those we managed to exercise a full as live flights, uh, and that was useful for us validating our, our team structures. Um, we did learn quite a lot as well. We, we learned that it's actually quite difficult to lift something that's powered when you haven't factored that into your airframe design early enough on. That's a, it turns into a very expensive lawnmower. Um, quite a nice noise though. Um, uh, we also learned the challenges about working different sorts of airspace. This will be a map that you'll be relatively familiar with from earlier um, presentations. It's our good friend, the solitary plane exercise area. Um, that presents particular challenges to a UAS system, but they're ones which, you know, taking the, the process professionally, engaging with the people who run that airspace, what was remarkable for us, coming into this from a very naive point of view, was actually just how open the people who manage airspace in the United Kingdom are. From the CAA to the, the military authorities who run this airspace, there's nobody there putting a block in our way to say, no, you can't do this for the sake of it. Everyone's there to have a conversation with you and to help you make this happen in a safe way. So for that, we are profoundly grateful. And this is a, this is a platform I'd like to use to, to extend that thanks to everybody who engaged with us. Um, everyone from managing the airspace, managing the ground as well. I mean, if we want to launch and recover on a part of the, natural, the, the National Trust, I believe, on the site around Stonehenge and National Heritage from the monument, both of those organizations absolutely pleased as punch to have us around and very, very engaged with the process. So I think, it, culturally, I don't think there are real barriers there amongst anybody involved. There are some real challenges to overcome, but it's, it's, it's salient that doing this right and doing this in a professional manner, you can bring an awful lot of people along to help you do this properly. These, by the way, are from our planning documents. We did develop a very thorough planning phase, uh, nine, step, uh, nine stream, three phase planning document, which we're very happy to share with others who would like to explore this from a commercial point of view or in broadcast, because it does cover the sort of broadcast challenges involved. Um, we think, learning from this project, we can contribute towards the further development of UAS in the broadcast domain, and possibly in a wider commercial domain as well. Um, we wouldn't presume to be able to advise on airframe certification, or on, or on design, or even on control systems, because we've worked alongside some people who are absolutely fantastic at that. But some areas where we have specific payloads we want to get in the air, we think we can contribute to that discussion. So, for our particular project, we flew this horrid, no, it's a lovely little camera. Um, it is just a commercial camcorder, it's got an, an XMOR chip, it's a CMOS, so obviously with high frequency vibrations you get the lovely, oh no, a dream sequences beginning effect. <laughs> um, also, of course, I mean, the, 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 the GoPro is, is does suffer actually from that as well, but it's such a nice little camera 
that it, it's playing very, very widespread application. This is that Sony camera you saw earlier on the book update. In this particular instance, it's got a few peripherals stuck onto it. But you can see, like a lot of cameras these days, this is interesting as well, broadcast video cameras are increasingly moving towards this really compact little form factor. Very dense, you know, not a lot of torque to move around when you're swiveling in a gimbal. And often very large chips as well. The, the Canon EOS uh, 5D, which we saw in the previous presentation, being used for videos, kicked along the professional video camera market such that Sony and Canon and Panasonic and many others are making these really tight little boxes that do very good quality video. Still at the only just at the edge of what we want for something like a, a landmark natural history unit show or you know a drama show which might want to use uh, content better than this way. But we do have dedicated researchers and skills within the R&D department and the wider BBC where we can start building up a, an idea of what are the optimum payloads for this kind of work. Um, we, so our athletes are a complicated issue. Um, this is a typical uh, current radio camera setup. Um, that'll do a line of sight link over microwave frequencies back to a base station. In the civil domain, I can't speak for the military domain because I just don't know. But in the civil domain, we have to keep our satellite links static. If we move them, we lose them. Um, and that means that moving a camera around, we've got to daisy chain it back. Uh, whether we're talking about on the uh, ground or in the air. On the ground, what we'd like to do is provide this net note type capability to move from one location to another quite happily whilst maintaining the satellite link back up. And that's where this pixelated, it's actually a cotton device. I downloaded the picture from the website then thought maybe they don't want it, so I pixelated it. Those of you who know what this looks like don't need to see the picture, the rest of you go to the website, it's fine. Um, it's a fairly lightweight system, it does provide a very good uh, tool, and it's used at the moment to provide point to point to point on the ground, but for every hop we do, we lose roughly half the capacity, so if we can do one of a, a loitering UAV, maybe in a sort of medium altitude, long endurance, or high altitude, long endurance flight profile, that would offer us enormous flexibility on a great many uh, spur of the ad hoc outside broadcast. That does talk about going into different sorts of flight regulation routines. We are totally, at the moment, for our, our content collection, looking at visual line of sight. The 500 meters, 400 foot envelope actually works very well. But it works, well, I'll come to why in a second. One area, another area we think we can help frame the debate and possibly contribute to is in the skills and logistics area. We were operating on a flight team of three. We had a role we called the flight director, who essentially plans the flight, gets the permissions, uh, makes sure that a safe environment is created for that flight. We had a pilot who is the safety pilot, and in this case, we had a very, very skilled pilot uh, to do that for it. He's also primarily responsible for the airframe uh, and does the landing and takeoff. We weren't doing automated landing and takeoff, but obviously that's an option, and by no means something we discount. We can see advantages in that. We had a ground control system and payload operator. Payloads, for us, are cameras for the most part, and operating a ground control system and operating the camera is a combined task and a real craft skill, and something that we think in the broadcast domain would have to be built up together. And it is, it's a unique craft skill, just in the way that somebody who operates a camera from a helicopter has a unique set of skills, or someone who operates a boom camera does, so would somebody using a camera in a UAS. And those skills are, well, we've always had kind of a teaching hospital role in the broadcast industry, we're kind of a little bit overstaffed, do a bit more training than you might think, and that's largely because a lot of those technical skills and craft skills then feed into the wider broadcast industry, and that's kind of part and parcel of the BBC's role. Um, I did point out the team size is at least three. We found that having a deputy flight director on hand was essential if you're going to do sustained flights through the day, and we did. We ran one day with uh, flights going from 9 a.m. to 3 to 5 p.m., which for us is a pretty sustained go, you touch, go, refuel, turn around and off again. If you're going to do that, if all your team are 100% focused on their job the whole time, you'll burn out three people in a couple of hours to the point where safety becomes an issue. Um, and on the logistics point of view as well, equipment size, we really want equipment that you can get in the back of one Land Rover. If, you, if I've got to take a Luton panel van to, to, to get a kit on site, that's just not worth it, because for a lot of time, I won't be able to get that vehicle back. <coughs> Stuff's got to be really small, so getting the specifications for what logistic footprint and broadcast suitable kit is, is worth pointing out. I did want to point out this slide, this is, this is actually, the, that's the BBC helicopter based down at Red Hill. That's nice, that's great, we're going to need that long term, it delivers us very good value, 
and we're going to have to maintain that sort of service. It does sorts of things for us that UAS complex never really could. Sure, there's some stuff we could do with taking quick UASs out into the field and getting quick reports, but that's often the first thing on the scene in anything that happens in the southeast. Um, that is really the kind of technology and budget that a UAS is going to have to get into. When you're doing beyond that visual line of sight, essentially you've got a 500 meter boom camera. You're going to have to manage it in that kind of way. You're going to, well, you've got some restrictions above and beyond that because you're going to want to stay back from the crowd line, 50 or 100 meters. To the gentleman from the Home Office, I can assure you, we've been very careful about this. <laughs> we are trying to set best practice as far as we can. So um, I think you might find that a lot of the times when the media guys go and show the, um, the UAS, this isn't to have a dig back at the industry at all, um, but often the UAS guys will go, yeah, look what it can do, great, and get a bit excited as well. So when you see it on a news report, it's often not the news team that are actually operating there. Uh, but it, actually staying back from a crowd line is fine. If I want to take a shot of a crowd at Glastonbury, for instance, then flying 200 metres outside the perimeter of there is absolutely great. I'm going to see the horizon, I'm going to see the whole thing, and the tops of people's heads, from a television point of view, are less interesting than the sides. From a telly point of view, I don't know about the police. So do that. Um, the one final thing I wanted to mention was the regulatory framework. We'd like to be engaged in that. We've got no problem with it right now. It was difficult for us, but it should be. Regulation of this for, for a naive company coming into it, doing it for the first time, should be hard work. That's my bucket of paperwork to take out on flight, and that's a lot of the other stuff I have. <coughs> this is my favourite document. This is our exemption from the air navigation order. Limited, I'll grant you, for flight tests. But we used it, and we used it well, and it was exceptionally valuable for us. Um, we would like to be a part of that. One area of regulation, which I believe the, 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 the aviation world doesn't necessarily want to grapple with, but is there, it's in the public debate, is the issue of privacy. I would mention that the, the BBC, in undertaking this latest project, did, under, did look at that carefully. Now, we do have editorial guidelines, and from our point of view, the privacy issue is largely an editorial issue. It's to do with what we publish. It isn't to do with what we record. And in that framework, the way that we handle privacy is much the same as we handle it with any other tool which has got quite high level. Now, this isn't to say that that policy would be universally applicable. But our editorial guidelines are available and I would entertain conversations about how other people could learn from our experience and our extreme sensitivity to these issues and that's something we'd be more than happy to share. Um, so that's basically it. After three years of on and off experimentation and six months of banging our shins against uh, a very expensive lawnmower, we have um, no active UASs within the BBC. <laughs> but we think we're well placed to engage with the debate longer term. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if in the next few years there were, at least on an experimental basis, ongoing trials with UASs. And hopefully, with some people in this room. Thank you very much.